Welcome back to Introduction to Logic, Module 7, as we continue our study in Propositional Calculus. Once again, I want to acknowledge that I stand on the shoulders of many who have come before me, and much of the information I am using, the way it's presented, some of the language in which it's presented, and many of the examples that I use come from philosopher James Feaster's work, much of which he has made available in open access material online as he developed his own course in logic. Now we began our study in propositional logic in module 5, where we focused on the meaning and importance of logical operators, and we also looked at how truth tables function. Then in module 6, we began our two-part study in propositional calculus. In that module, we looked at several rules of inference or implication, derived rules, and then rules of replacement or equivalency. Now, this module is relatively short because if you're in my class, we've got to make sure that we nail down propositional calculus. So much of our time this week is going to be spent practicing because we do have an exam coming up and that exam will target exclusively our understanding of propositional calculus. Yet there is a little more I want to show you. Although it is not much, it's really only two moves that we're looking at today. I did not want to overwhelm you in the last module, so we waited to talk about our hypothetical rules. Moreover, you will be able to catch on to these rules of assumption much more quickly if you already have a working knowledge and comfort with the other rules you learned in the last module. So we don't really have much to cover in this module. We're really just learning two new rules, but they do have to be treated in particular ways. And so it was worth learning the other rules and now giving special attention to these two new maneuvers. Now what we are talking about today can go by a number of names. It can show up in your language and thinking in a number of ways. We're talking about when we need to make assumptions or we are formulating hypotheses or supposing something might be true for the sake of a thought experiment or sometimes we don't have the absolute evidence for something. We can't prove something with our empirical methodology, and we can't prove something in such a way as to make it logically obvious. For example, we might be able to prove that if something is the case, then all of this would follow, but we may not be able to prove beyond all shadow of a doubt that this is absolutely the case. Sometimes the best we've got is an inference to the best possible explanation. And so our arguments may lead us to a conditional. We may work our way to a conclusion that if this is the case, then all of that will follow. Some philosophers like to think about possible worlds or multiverses or things like this. And so when we think about the logic of other possible worlds, whether or not something is possible in that world or impossible, or logically necessary, or a contingent fact, when we think about how logic operates in that world, we first have to assume something, don't we? We are formulating a hypothesis, and we are asserting a hypothetical world. Before we can think about what might or has to be the case in that world, we first have to assume that such a world is possible. Assuming there is a world like this, what would follow? That first move of assuming the hypothetical is really what we're talking about here. In our arguments, there may be times that we assume one piece of evidence in order to show that if that is the case, the rest of the argument will follow. Scientific inquiry and investigation of the natural world cannot begin with what is certain about the natural world. It first begins with what seems to be the case. That is what pure empirical methodology is. We observe what seems to be the case. Now from prior modules we understand that this is inductive reasoning. We distinguish between deductive and inductive reasoning and we said that empirical methodology or the scientific study of the natural world always pivots from the foundation of inductive logic. But that is not to say that scientists cannot and do not also apply deductive logic. So the scientific method might be thought of as a cycle or a pendulum swing between these two approaches to logic. 
From observation and inference, we formulate hypotheses. So we might begin in a purely descriptive way. This is a unique thing that functions in a unique way. We will call it X. This is very similar and functions similarly. It is also an X. And once we become confident of what the X is and contrasting it with what X is not, then we might begin to say things like, this X functions in this way, and that X functions in this way, and this X also functions in this way. And this may bring us to the conclusion that all X function in this way. But we cannot really know that for certain. There is no certainty with inductive reasoning. There is only some degree of probability. And if we eventually have a large number of observations and they all reinforce the conclusion that X functions in this way, and we've encountered no counterexamples, then we might say that we have a high degree of probability, that it is probable or even highly probable that all X function in this way. Now, if we have reached a level of high probability, then we may begin to treat this as what is the case when we approach our investigations. Once we have much evidence to support the conclusion and no real reason to doubt it as of yet, our approach may shift from, is this an X, does it function in that way? Is this an X, does it function in that way? To beginning with an assumption from prior observations. We have concluded that all X function in this way. If all X function in this way, and this is an X, then this too will function in that way. So at some point, in order to move beyond this question and expand our scientific knowledge, we begin to treat the conclusion from our inferences, once they seem strong enough, as guiding principles to form other arguments. Or that is, we assume the truth of our conclusions in order to see what else might follow. So scientific method ebbs and flows between induction and deduction. And when it shifts from induction to deduction, it often uses hypothetical assumptions in formulating a new hypothesis and then shifts back to induction in order to test the hypothesis. From what seems to be the case, given our repeated observations, we then formulate a hypothesis. This seems to be the case. If that is the case, note the hypothetical, then this would follow, it seems. Let's suppose that this is the case. Does it follow? Indeed it does. That fits the evidence of my experience, so until we find contrary evidence, it seems to be that this is the best explanation for this natural phenomenon. So we cannot always work towards what is obvious. Sometimes the best we've got is what seems to be the best explanation for something. Or we may have what indeed follows logically, but it follows from something that we can only say seems to be the case. If P, then Q. We've no reason to believe that Q is not the case. So we've no reason to cast doubt on P. And in fact, we've got good reason for thinking that P is the case. However, we've not actually proved P. So the best we can do is say, if P, then Q necessarily. And there's good reason for thinking P. And the best proof we could give would be to say, suppose P is the case. Then you'll find that indeed Q follows. So we can provide a proof, but it's a hypothetical proof. And if we're building the case for the fact that if P then Q, and we don't have P, but there's good reason for thinking it, our argument is trying to show that Q will necessarily follow if P is the case. So we build our argument, we reach the conclusion, therefore, if P then Q. But how could we really prove the conclusion? Again, the best we could do is to assume P is the case. And if we assume or hypothesize or suppose P is true, we will be able to show that Q will follow. This is one type of hypothetical, one involving a conditional proposition. There's another type of hypothetical we will look at in this module, 
a favorite of Socrates, when he would dialogue with people about things like the nature and meaning of justice, he loved to get them to put forth a definition and then to assume their definition is correct and move forward until they reached a point that they discovered a contradiction. That definition doesn't work. So we've got to go back to the beginning and provide a better definition and leave this line of reasoning behind. This is called the reductio ad absurdum, and it can be helpful when trying to construct a logical proof. If you reach a conclusion and you want to find whether that conclusion is a good one, try assuming that it's not. Assuming that your conclusion is false, try to work through a proof. If you discover a contradiction, if your assumption leads to a contradiction, then the assumption is not a good one. Since you assumed that your conclusion was false, then this reinforces the validity of your conclusion. So let's dive in and look more closely at these proofs. We begin with a conditional introduction, or what's more commonly called a conditional proof. If the conclusion of the argument you are attempting to show is a conditional, then you may assume the antecedent in order to show in your proof that if that assumption is taken, the consequent can be shown to follow. So here we assume P and then we get Q in order to show that if P then Q. For example, P, therefore, if it's the case that if P then Q, then Q is the case. Now, it is important to notice here that this part of our proof is indented and noted with a vertical line. This signals that something is being introduced, a hypothetical, and we must completely resolve this aspect of our proof before moving on. And once we have resolved our hypothetical, we do away with all of that information. The conclusion of our hypothetical reasoning may show up as a new line in our overall proof, but each line within the area of our hypothetical proof is no longer relevant to the overall proof. So in this case, our conclusion is a conditional. If, if P then Q, then Q. So in order to construct a proof, we may assume as a hypothesis that if P then Q is true. So we introduce a hypothetical line, if P then Q, we note that our justification for this move is that we are making an assumption. We are putting forth a hypothesis for the conditional proof. Now we can derive, hypothetically, that Q is the case. For this follows from our assumption, if P then Q, and from line 1, P is the case. So lines 2 and 1 give us line 3 by way of modus ponens. And so we've demonstrated, hypothetically, that if we have if P then Q, then we can prove Q. So our conditional conclusion that if P then Q will lead us to Q seems valid. So now that we've acquired a conclusion for our conditional proof, we can move back to our line within our overall proof, leaving the hypothetical lines of reasoning, and insert this conclusion as a line of evidence in our overall proof, and we note that this comes from lines two through three by way of a conditional proof, by way of our hypothetical reasoning. So we can use a conditional proof any time the conclusion we need is a conditional. And the way that we go about this is to introduce the antecedent of that conditional as a hypothesis. And then we work to derive the intended consequent to that conditional. Now the other type of hypothetical reasoning we are looking at in this module is called an indirect proof or a negation introduction. Here we're going to assume P is the case, then we're going to try to get Q and not Q, which is a contradiction, and this will give us the conclusion not P. And the point here is actually to find a contradiction. If we assume P, and this leads us to the contradiction that Q is the case and not Q is the case, then we have reason to reject P. If assuming P will lead us to the contradiction, then the logical conclusion is that P is not the case. Now, since what we are trying to show is that the assumption is wrong, 
it is important to note that what we are assuming is the opposite of what we have concluded. Now, if we present an argument and the actual conclusion of our argument leads to a contradiction, then our argument is invalid and we should do away with it. But if we present an argument and reach a conclusion and we have reason to think that conclusion is valid, if we assume that the opposite conclusion is true and that assumption leads us to a contradiction, this tells us that the assumption is the invalid conclusion and our original answer was the valid conclusion. For example, P and Q is the case, or P is the case. Therefore, P is the case. Now here, since we have the answer P is true, we're going to assume that it's not the case that P is true. So we indent our lines, we use vertical lines to signal our hypothetical reasoning, and the first line of our hypothetical proof is not P is the case. And we simply note that this is our hypothesis for an indirect proof, or this is our assumption. From this assumption, by way of a disjunctive syllogism, we can conclude that P and Q is the case, because P and Q is true, or P is true. But assuming that it is not the case that P, we are left with P and Q as true. If P and Q is true, then we can derive P by way of simplification. But now that we have P in line 4 and not P in line 2, a conjunction can give us it is the case that P and not P, which is a contradiction. Therefore, since we found a contradiction by assuming not P, we can safely conclude P is true. And this becomes the new line in our original proof, the overall proof, leaving behind now these lines of hypothetical reasoning. And we note the justification for concluding this new line of evidence, P is true, as coming from lines 2 through 5 by way of indirect proof. Now this is a quick way of proving a conclusion by assuming its opposite and then drawing a contradiction from that assumption. So the procedure was to negate the intended conclusion as a hypothesis, draw an explicit contradiction from the negation, and then infer our original conclusion from this line of reasoning. And to be clear, the explicit contradiction or absurd conclusion or absurdity comes in the form P is true and not P is true, or it is the case that P is true and it is not the case that P is true. Now this method of reasoning is also called reductio ad absurdum, or a reduction to absurdity, and we learned in module one that this was a favorite approach of Socrates. Now that's it for this module. There's really just these two rules that I want you to add to your tool belt. The conditional proof and the indirect proof or the conditional introduction and the negation introduction. Now we've already covered how to do them, but there are some guidelines that it will be beneficial for you to keep in mind. First, each hypothesis introduced into a proof begins a new vertical line. It is possible, as I will show you in a moment, to introduce more than one hypothesis. When this happens, each new line of hypothetical reasoning gets its own new area signaled by the vertical lines. Next, no occurrence of a formula to the right of a vertical line may be cited in any rule applied after the line has ended. In other words, once you've worked through your hypothetical lines of reasoning, that special space dedicated to working through your assumptions, once you reach the conclusion from that hypothesis and you move back to the main lines of reasoning in the overall original proof, you cannot go back to that hypothetical line of reasoning to cite any of those lines to try to build a case for something else later in your overall argument. Third, if two or more hypotheses are in effect simultaneously, then the order in which they are discharged must be the reverse of the order in which they are introduced. And a proof is never complete until all the hypotheses have been discharged. Next, 
When the conclusion is an atomic formula, meaning a proposition of the most basic or simplistic form, such as P or not Q. In such a case, if no other strategy is immediately apparent, then hypothesize the negation of the conclusion and proceed with an indirect proof. When the conclusion is a negated formula, hypothesize the conclusion without its negation sign and proceed with an indirect proof. When a conclusion is a conjunction, prove each of the conjuncts separately and then conjoin them. When a conclusion is a disjunction, sometimes though not often, a disjunctive conclusion can be proved directly simply by proving one of its disjuncts and then applying addition or the introduction of a disjunction. Otherwise, hypothesize the negation of the conclusion and try an indirect proof. When the conclusion is a conditional, hypothesize the antecedent and then derive the consequent by way of conditional proof. And finally, when the conclusion is a biconditional, you can use a conditional proof twice in order to prove each of the two conditionals needed to then obtain the conclusion by way of biconditional introduction. So let's look at an example. If R, then S. Therefore, if R is the case, then S or T. Now we don't have the information to know for certain that R is absolutely the case. But we have good reasons for thinking that R is the case. So let's assume that R is the case for a conditional proof. If R is the case, then S is the case. We know this by way of modus ponens from lines one and two. If we know that S is true, then we can simply add an alternative possibility that T might also be true. And so we get S or T from line three by way of addition. Now we have everything we need to show that if we assume R, then we will get S or T. Therefore, we move back to our main line of our proof, leaving our hypothetical reasoning behind. And in our main proof, we note that we now have evidence for the conclusion, if R, then S or T. And we reach this evidence using a conditional proof. Here's another easier example using a conditional proof. A and B is true. Therefore, if A, then B. Let's assume that A is the case and proceed with a conditional proof. We can also derive B from line one using simplification. Now pause here. We could also have gotten A from line one by way of simplification without a conditional proof. But what would that have given us? Only that A is true and B is true. It would not have demonstrated any form of conditional relationship. So with our conditional proof, we are assuming a conditional relationship and the truth of the antecedent. And so we're trying to see if it's possible to obtain the consequent after having assumed the conditional relationship and the antecedent. And indeed, in this case, it is possible. And so we can conclude the conditional relationship if A then B by way of hypothetical reasoning, specifically lines two through three using a conditional proof. Now let's consider an indirect proof. If S is the case or T is the case, then not S is the case. Therefore, not S is the case. We want to know that not S is a valid conclusion, so we are going to assume just the opposite. So let's assume that S is the case. And this is our hypothesis for an indirect proof. Well, assuming S is true, all we have to do is add another option. So S or T by way of line two using addition. And now we have a modus ponens, line one, if S or T, then not S. Line three, S or T. Therefore, we conclude line four, not S. And so conjoining lines two and four, we find a contradiction. S is true and not S is true. Therefore, leaving our hypothetical lines of reasoning back to our main proof, line six in the main proof tells us that not S is the case, and we came to this by way of 
indirect proof using lines two through five. And so we have proven our conclusion by demonstrating that assuming the opposite conclusion would lead us to contradiction. Now I wanted to find some examples for you where we have multiple assumptions embedded into a single argument. And they come in two forms. In one case, we have an argument, we assume something to get a conclusion, and then proceeding with our main argument, we find that we need to assume something else in order to show everything we're trying to show. In another case, we may have to make an assumption and then within that line of hypothetical reasoning, make a second assumption. And so we will need to deal with that second line of hypothetical reasoning in order to conclude the first line of hypothetical reasoning in order to move back to our main argument. So I found some really good examples for you and I want to give credit here. The examples that I found come from a professor named Mark Thorsby who has his own videos on logic and both of these examples come from a video of his dealing with conditional proofs. So first, here's an example in which you might have to make more than one assumption within your overall argument in order to complete the argument. Premise one, if G, then H and I. Premise two, if J, then K and L. Premise three, G is the case or J is the case. Therefore, H is the case or K is the case. Now, how might one prove H or K from lines one through three? Well, first we can assume that G is the case. If G is the case, then lines one and four give us H and I. And we come to this by way of modus ponens. Now that we have H and I on line five, we can simplify that so that we have simply H is the case. And so leaving our hypothetical reasoning behind, we can conclude in line seven that if G is the case, then H will follow. And we know this from lines four through six by way of a conditional proof. But now what? We still cannot get from if G then H to our conclusion H is true or K is true. So what do we do? Well, line three tells us that G is true or J is true, and we've already seen what follows if G is true. So let's assume J is true. Assuming J in line eight, we can derive K and L because line two tells us if J is true, then K and L will be true. And based on our assumption, line eight now tells us that J is true. So in line nine, we get K and L, from lines two and eight by way of modus ponens. Now from line nine, K and L, we can simplify. And line 10, we have K. Now we can leave the area of our hypothetical reasoning and move back to the lines of our main proof and assert our evidence that if J, then K. And we reach this from lines eight through 10 by way of a conditional proof. Now our two separate assumptions have given us hypothetical proofs for if G then H and if J then K. So now based on line three, G or J, line seven, if G then H and line 11, if J then K, we can conclude H or K. And this comes by way of lines three, seven and 11 and a constructive dilemma. And within our final example, we will have a hypothesis embedded within a hypothesis. So here's the argument. If L is the case, then it will be the case that if M, then N or O. And we have reason to believe that if M is the case, then not N. Therefore, if L is the case, then it is not the case that M or it is the case that O. So here our conclusion is a conditional, so let's assume the antecedent is true. So assume L in line three. Based on that new information, modus ponens gives us if M, then N or O. Now we have another conditional. Let's assume that M is the case. Notice that we have indented yet further and we're using a new set of vertical lines. 
Now recall our guideline from earlier. If we have a hypothetical embedded within a hypothetical, we need to resolve them in the opposite order they were introduced. So now we have a second hypothetical. We need to resolve this before moving back to our first line of hypothetical reasoning and then resolve that to move back to the main argument. So if we assume that M is true, then we can get N or O from lines four and five by way of modus ponens. Now from line five, M is the case, and from line two, if M, then not N, also by way of modus ponens, we can derive not N. Now we have N or O in line six and not N in line seven, and by way of a disjunctive syllogism, we can conclude that O is the case. So we found evidence within our first line of hypothetical reasoning that if we have M, we can get N or O. And so we assume that M is the case, and we demonstrated that indeed we got O. So now we are discharging that second line of hypothetical reasoning and moving back to the first line of hypothetical reasoning, to give evidence in line 9 that if M, then O. And we attain that evidence using a conditional proof. Now, our first hypothetical has not been discharged, and so we are still working through that reasoning. We now have in line 9, if M, then O, and using our newly acquired rules of equivalence or replacement, you should know that from if M, then O, we can derive not M or O. Well, this is what we were looking for, isn't it, in our initial hypothetical. We had the conclusion, if L, then not M or O, and we wanted to demonstrate that if L is the case, not M or O will follow. And so we assumed that L is the case, and indeed, we proved that given L, not M or O will follow. And so we now discharge this line of hypothetical reasoning and move back to our main lines of evidence for the overall argument. And there we assert our new evidence, if L, then not M or O. And we came to this evidence by way of lines three through 10 using a conditional proof. This is the end of module seven and the end of our study in propositional calculus. Familiarize yourself with these two new maneuvers and then practice, practice, practice everything we've learned in the past two modules. Learn well the rules of inference and implication, the derived rules, and the rules of replacement and equivalency. In the next module, we shift gears to focus more in depth on informal fallacies, and we begin to prepare for module nine and our exploration of categorical logic with some fun food for thought provided by Lewis Carroll the author of Alice in Wonderland. So until next time, study well, ponder long, and have a great week.